Mike, welcome. Thank good you. to see you. Yeah, How's you it too. going? Going well. Good Feeling group. good? Nice turnout. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice to see it growing. Yeah, 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 exactly. Doubling in size since our first year. So let's talk about the uh, AT&T DirecTV merger and let's work forward from there. So you were at AT&T for about 18 yeah, years 18. or so. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about what that does to the company and, and you know, the, the pre-deal, sort of post-deal. Yeah, you know, it, uh, to your comment before, it makes us uh, the largest MVPD in the U.S. right now, which, you know, if you'd have, you know, we, we, had, we, had our U -verse, we had our U verse television business, which was a nice growing business, six million subscribers, but we weren't really a, 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 a national player. And so with the merger, we've become a national player in the advertising business, you know, representing roughly 25% of all the pay TV households now. So for, for our advertising business, it's a huge shot in the arm. Um, and, and Which I think, is interesting, right? Because AT and T actually never had any salespeople, but you guys made a lot of money in advertising. Yeah, we had. So that, from a, from an ad, there's. I'll, I'll speak to the merger maybe in two regards. One, there's sort of the now from an advertising perspective, and to your point, the legacy. It's a really good combo, and we talk about yield management. We feel like we've got a good yield management approach laid out for how we go forward. Um, the legacy Uverse business was very much focal, focused on the local business. We were represented by the local cable interconnects. We had a, we had a small national business, but it was, most of our revenue came from the local side. DirecTV was just the opposite, a, a robust national business. And so, you know, from a, we kind of looked at the looked at the various ways to go to market, looked at the yield opportunity, and I think we're going to move forward with a blend of the two and try to maximize try to maximize the local opportunity where you see higher CPMs uh, typically, and then really focus on the national business as well, specifically addressable television. So that's sort of the first sort of, I'd say, what's happening right now. And then I think there's a longer term or mid to longer term opportunity for not only the company, but specific for this room, you know, the advertising side of the business, where because now we have scale from a, from a distributor standpoint, it gives us access to content from all the great companies in this room. And then with our mobile distribution, you know, over 100 million mobile subscribers, there's an opportunity to create some new models to distribute that content uh, nationwide. So now we are a, you know, full footprint nationwide TV and mobile company. And I think as traditional viewership starts to, not starts, continues to shift, you know, from the living room to different screens, hopefully that combo of a national footprint on both television and mobile puts us in a good spot not only as a distributor, but certainly from advertising. Let's talk about that, the addressable opportunity. And, you know, we heard from the last panel that, you know, how linear uh, is transforming new technology, going to make that more IP driven. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and addressable is one of those opportunities that feels and looks a lot like digital, right? Mm -hmm. You're using data, you're using a DMP, uh, you're able to target people down to the household level, potentially even down to the set-top box level. Uh, which is incredibly powerful. How are you guys thinking about addressable in terms of uh, making money? Mm -hmm. Where are you aiming? You know, who are some of the buyers? Like, what are some of the things that you're seeing? Yeah, on the addressable side. So that's it's that's our. We do a lot of different things in AdWorks, but addressable TV is really our focus. You know, we fit, we've got a leadership position in addressable linear television right now. We can reach 12 and a half million homes addressably, and, and I, there's you know addressable and programmatic are sort of the you know terms that are loosely defined. I'd say in the industry, when I when I'm my definition of addressable as I'm talking about it up here is a specific ad in the same break on the same network to different houses. So or, or different ads in the same break in the same network to different houses. So one ad gets the pan, one one house gets the Pampers ad, the next house next to it in the exact same break gets the Budweiser ad, the next one gets the fitness ad, whatever. Um, we can do that across 12 and a half million homes today, uh, but we have 25 million homes. So our first big opportunity is to grow that addressable base. The way we do addressability is at the set-top box level through an NVIDIA solution. Bruce Anderson standing up in the back of the room there. Uh, and so our priority one is to grow that base of customers and grow that, grow that addressable business. Um, that's the linear TV side. What we're also very focused on, though, is taking that cross-screen and doing true cross-screen addressability. I think a lot of people do cross-screen addressability today, but those screens typically are a computer and a tablet or a computer and a smartphone. Conspicuously absent has been the living room. And so where, we've, where we're putting a lot of time and energy is true cross-screen addressable, meaning 
target the household as well as the devices associated with those same households with an integrated campaign. Um, and that's like, that's a major deal, right? Because if you look at all the, the surveys of people, you know, and everyone in the room who is watching TV, you know, has their phone, so it's a very common situation where people are sitting around the television and everyone's facing down. Right. 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 So when the commercials come on, everyone faces down. That's right. So what we did in November, we launched a beta with Opera Media Works, and, and we, we the Chinese company. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, <laughs> For the yeah, a little twist of a little twist in in the of fate this week. So we'll, uh, we'll, Mike's we'll, closest partner that drives a lot of their business got acquired from a no-name Chinese private equity firm, which he's thrilled about. This Opera Media Works did so on Tuesday. So we'll see how that we'll see how that ultimately shakes out. But it, but we have three large beta clients that we kicked off in November. Results are coming in. But what we, what we did is we matched at the household address level. So we were able to take Opera's location data that they have through, their, through, the, through the fact that they are predominantly an app-based uh, ad network and have real good lat long information. So we matched that household address with our addressable TV household address. The, the, where there was overlap is where we delivered the integrated campaigns for these three companies. So we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're, we'll be in a position to be able to announce results soon, but preliminarily, preliminary results really show what we thought it might show, and actually it's good news for the people in this room, at least your parent companies, um, and that is mobile. You know, we saw, lift in, we saw lift when exposed to mobile. Um, the lift I'm talking about is purchase lift. We saw lift when exposed to mobile. We saw lift when exposed to addressable television, but we saw incremental lift when exposed to both. But I will tell you, television drove the most. So, you know that the sort of the 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 adage of, you know, TV is still alive even though it's under pressure. I think is is we will validate when we release these results. Um, but but there certainly is incremental lift associated with uh, an integrated campaign. Now you you used you worked with Opera on that. So but you have you have all the mobile data, right? Right, and you have all the set-top box data, right? So now in theory you could. Yeah, so do the, that yourself, right? Is that yeah, sort of inventory becomes inventory is the issue for us, right? So we don't we're, we're not a digital publisher mm -hmm. at scale today. Now, as some of these as, as viewership moves off screen, as TV everywhere grows, as as over the top grows, um, if we make acquisitions, you know, as we as we get access to owned and operated digital inventory, I think we can we can make a scaled play ourselves, doing it ourselves, at, at, and and we will do that. Uh, to get out of the gate at scale, we needed a partner, and that's and that's what we've done with Opera. So, your yield curve kind of looks like there's a lot of, lot of different things going on, that's and, right. and you've got your own direct sales team. Mm -hmm. You're selling programmatically. Mm -hmm. You've got not really. Pro we're, we're 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 getting we're we're you're moving. Ge you're into gearing, you're gearing up right. for programmatic, right. so that'll be a big part of it, especially with addressable and, right. and some of those opportunities there. And then you've got third parties. Other MVPDs and MSOs That's right. selling your inventory. That's right. So, so there's a lot going on here. So, so from so from a yield standpoint, from a yield standpoint, so, how are you guys thinking about? Yeah, the way we, I'd say we 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 took a a more structured approach to it initially, and just looked at looked at on an impression basis where we were seeing the highest CPM between traditional national business, you know, traditional DR business. Uh, national addressable business and the local business, and so we, as you sort of throw all those into the hat and just look at look at CPM across those different businesses. Obviously, DR has the lowest rate, and if you could not sell any DR, that'd be great. But mm -hmm. there's going to be a market for that. Um, and then and then you start to look at the the traditional general rate business. I'll call it you know the full footprint national business. That that's sort of next on the curve. And then you get into local and and, and national addressable, and those two, depending on the category, have very I'd say very similar CPMs generally. So we made a decision. We're going we're to carve out a piece of our a piece of our total inventory and, and assign it to the to the MVPDs on the local interconnect side of the world, and then the rest. What is the interconnect? So the interconnect um, is the concept of on a local on a local level. It used to be, and this was years ago. Each each cable company, and, and then you know what became telco, telcos and satellite companies, would trot in their own salesperson, and so you'd have literally you know four or five salespeople in a particular market, calling on the same buyer, explaining why you should buy you should buy my two hundred thousand subscribers. No, you should buy my three hundred thousand subscribers. No, you should buy my you know one hundred fifty thousand subscribers. 
And the local businesses were saying, look, I can, I can buy the whole market from the, from the local broadcast affiliates. And so it was, a, it, was, it was limited success that the cable companies could have. So the interconnect was formed where a decision was sort of made to say, look, we'll all pool our inventory together, and whoever has the most subscribers in the market will represent the market. And so now you know, Comcast in Chicago or Time Warner in Dallas go, represents all, all distributors in that market and takes a consolidated plan to a, to a buyer. Uh, presents that plan and, and effectively can tell that buyer, I can reach the entire Chicago or Dallas market. And then we just all get our prorated share of the revenue sold based on the percent of subscribers we have. So it's worked very well. It's a, it's a you know, we're better together than apart uh, uh, philosophy. And especially when you think about the inroads digital has made in the local markets, uh, pooling that inventory together to sell, um, to sell really against the other emerging players in the market has been a very successful model. Let's talk about, so there's a lot of content publishers in the room, media companies that air their content, distribute it through folks like yourself, uh, Verizon, Comcast, and so forth. And currently, uh, you know, the MVPD plays a lot, pays a lot of money mm -hmm. for that content. And you, but you guys are doing something a little different where you're investing in short form content. And you, you, you did a deal with uh, the Turn In Group, Turn -in which group. is uh, Otter Media. Yeah and they're effectively a studio and funneling you guys content that's short form. And if you're a millennial, uh, you know, there's a lot of these different little shows that everyone knows about that none of us in this room know about, yeah, right. but it's just an enormous amount of eyeballs. And talk about that and its role in helping you flip the whole TV model on its head to, to you know, yeah. and, and how you're using that partnership. Yeah, and I don't know, so, and that's so, all digital in a way, it's all, right? It's all like my yeah, phone. It, it, and, and it, yeah, it's, it is all digital, yeah. And, and the primary driver there is full screen, uh, one of the larger MCNs. Um, uh, uh, Crunchyroll and Rooster Teeth are the three properties mm -hmm. that, that really comprise most of the impressions. So, so what Crunchyroll, Rooster Teeth, show of hands. Yeah, exactly, right? It's like, yeah. One, Kenrick. <laughs> um, not so what, what, what Otter Media is, and it's O-T-T-E-R to play on the word O-T-T, but Otter Media is a joint venture between AT&T and the Churning Group. Um, so it's a, it's, it is a separate entity uh, outside of both companies that's a JV. And, and I wouldn't say it's designed to flip the model, the traditional model on its head, because I think the traditional model serves all of us in this room pretty well, and we're all trying to defend it to the best of our ability. But just like a lot of folks in this room are, you know, streaming direct to customers or figuring out a way to, to go over the top, but we are too. And so that's really what the Otter Media JV is, is a, a first foray into, it's, it's different than the traditional model, but it's our first foray into a direct paying, consumer you, over the top It's more model. of a JV, so is it like a rev share? It's, it's a, uh, we, it, it it's, like a, a, it's a, you're uh, paying them for that content. Both us and, and, and churn and own a portion of the, comp own a portion of the company. Um, and so we just split the, you know, split the cost, split the expenses. It's kind of the typical, typical JV model, split the revenues. But um, so, you know, so far it's been successful. Um, the focus, the focus really, to your point about some of these unknown, unknown to us, but very prominent to millennials. The focus really has been about content, and frankly, content placement. So we haven't, or ever, uh, product placement. So we haven't gotten, we AdWorks haven't gotten really involved in Otter just yet but Otter will play a key role in our cross-screen addressability efforts over time to where we can link the millennials consuming Otter content on their devices with addressable TV households and really be able to go after those millennials on any screen. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, long, the, the midterm vision, I'd say, from, a, from an AdWorks perspective relative to Otter. Got it. So who, you know, it's always funny when you talk about an MVPD and, or a telco or you know, a TV company, wherever you guys are at this point, yeah. for a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so who do you think is your competition, right? Like, is, are, are you competing with your partners that, that are also selling your media? Or We didn't rehearse this one, but I'm, no, no, I'm no, throwing it's, it at no, you it's anyway, it's, just no. to kind of. No, you know, guys, we, we fight a lot of fronts. We fight battles on a lot of fronts. I would, you know, corporately, corporately, if you look at our business, um, enterprise business, so, you know, voice and data network and mobility sales to enterprise businesses, huge chunk of our business, about a third of our business. Um, and so the competition there is the British telecoms of the world and the Verizons of the world and some of the, the, the dark fiber providers that are out there selling Ethernet services to, to office buildings, et cetera. But 
as you may see by about every other ad that runs on television today, the mobile business is fiercely competitive. And mm -hmm. so, so I would say that, that corporately our, our primary focus is on, from a competitive standpoint, is you know, the, the Verizons, the T-Mobiles, the Sprints of the world. Uh, that's really where we're waging our biggest battle, I would say. Um, and then from, from a pure advertising perspective, you know, the panel before I think laid it out pretty well. I think, you know, to some extent we all compete for the same ad dollars, but I think we all have common enemies now with the emerging, you know, the emerging ad tech players, you know, the, the Googles and the Facebook. So really, I, I'd say three fronts, enterprise business, consumer mobility, and then from an advertising perspective, the emerging giants or the Certainly established mobile giants. mobile gives you a leg up over the traditional MVPD that doesn't have, it, 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 some people believe, you know, Comcast should buy T-Mobile, right? right? And then that would yeah, be I mean, a problem, right? It, well, it would, it, they would have, it, it would, I mean, it'd make them a more viable competitor, obviously, sure, right. um, no question about it. From an advertising perspective, though, they would have the same, the same dilemma that we have in terms of access to inventory, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have a right. ton of, we have 100 million mobile devices, but very little owned and operated mobile inventory, and that's something that, you know, from a strategic perspective, we're, we're, we're working on. And I think the, the OTT effort and this, this concept that I, that I sort of let off the conversation with, this concept of having a national footprint from a distri distribution, ac access to content, and an ability to distribute that content nationally, I think that will get us that owned and operated inventory that, that will allow us to be a player in a mobile ad space. So, so companies, one of the themes uh, this year, yesterday, today is, and even at, at Jason's event last week at, at DCN, this whole idea that their publishers are, media companies are di diversifying, right? And they're mm -hmm. trying new things. If you're a print publisher, you're trying video. If you're a video publisher, you're trying OTT. Uh, you might be engaged in an e-commerce play, right? There's lots of different things that, that people are, are trying. I know you guys are doing some similar things, but when you think about over-the-top subscription, where, which is kind of competitive in a way, if a sure. programmer decides that they're going to do their own OTT service, and you know, do you think that they're going to be successful? Because that's been in the news lately, right? It's like, you know, is HBO going to grow? And they're at 800,000 subs, but are they going to flatten out? And yeah. you know, like, where where's that to the extent you can talk about? Where do you think that's going? You know, like, it's funny. It's is, um, is that going to work? Or, or do they need people like you? Well, I think, I, think, I, mean, I, I mean, I think there's probably, like anything, there's sort of the S-curve. And, you know, and I think it's, it seems to be working in moderate, it seems to be working okay today. I don't think that anyone probably feels like they've got a solution that will disrupt overnight the current model. And then, like I say, the current model works, has worked well for this whole room for a long time. Um, but let's face it, as viewership has declined and has moved to different places, we've all struggled with, okay, what are we gonna do? You know, it's sort of like every, every, every person for themselves, you gotta go try to figure out what's best for your business. Mm -hmm. the, funny, you know, the funny thing about these uh, over-the-top apps is you, you know, we all have a dozen or more of them on our iPads right now, right? And, and, it's, and so at some point you're gonna go, man, it would be great if I could just aggregate all these apps into one place. Well, that's kind of what the current model does. It's just what's broken about the current model is content costs go up for the people, or production costs go up for people in this room. Therefore, content costs go up to, for us as distributors. Therefore, retail prices go up for consumers and then cord cutting happens. And so, you know, we've sort of done this to ourselves. And so if there are, you know, we're talking about data, talking about addressability, if there are ways that this industry for the good of itself can come together and maybe share some, some, some things across, across those types of areas, data, addressability, whatever the case may be, um, for the good of the model, I right. think you'll start to see some things like that happen. Sort of work together in a cooperative environment, if you will. <laughs> Potentially, right? Yeah. I, mean, I, th I mean, I would say that would be a good, that would be a good first step to take, or a good next step to take, before, you know, before we all just sort of go our own separate ways and try to out OTT each other. I don't, I don't think that, I don't think, I don't think that long term, save for maybe a few really sacred apps that are, that are just must watch type of things, um, I don't think that some new go-it-alone OTT model where we're all just doing it to ourselves um, will be as successful as the current approach that we have. Now, but market forces 
are hard to ignore, right? I mean, the comment earlier about the, the music industry, or I, came, I, I spent some time in our Yellow Pages business. I mean, there are just certain business models that just are not gonna live forever. And, uh, and hopefully this isn't one of them, but we're under pressure like those other businesses were. I think those other businesses, I know in the Yellow Pages we were slow to react to digital. Uh, it sounds like with radio they were slow to react to the you know, a la carte song versus the, the album. Uh, we shouldn't be slow or continue to be slow to react to what's going on without first trying to figure out ways to maybe help each other. Right, lean into it, as right. Kevin said. So um, do we have any thoughts or comments from the audience? Do we get a microphone here in the front room? Um, welcome, Bernie. I said hello <laughs> to you got this up. morning. And you weren't here <laughs> when I said kidding. hello to you, by the way. Here's your big shot to make it up to everybody. <laughs> Just taking care of Bourbon Street. It was a little messy yeah. <laughs> after last night. So uh, Mike, the uh, sort of elephant in the room, or where the big question hanging out there is, what's going to happen to Yahoo, the pieces? There have been certainly published reports saying AT&T, Verizon, maybe some others might be buyers. Uh, you're probably not going to directly answer that question, so I'll phrase it a little bit differently and say, what do you see about the Yahoo assets that might be relevant or logical uh, to roll into some piece of AT&T? Uh, eyeballs, content, and ad tech. You know, I mean, eyeballs, they have a ton of eyeballs, ton of users, uh, lots of content that attracts those users, and, and ad tech that, that we don't and there's have. There's still some cash there. It's not... It's not a completely dead business. No, no, I'm not. Yeah, no. Obviously, there's there, and, and, yeah, and, and a business that that is uh, you know under pressure, but still a significant significant ad business. So, um, to the ex you know, would that be an asset that would help check a box that, that I you know mentioned earlier? Sure, it would. Sure, it would. I, you know, so I mean, I'm not I'm not I'm not like confirming or denying anything. I'm just saying that that's the type of thing that that at you know could give us instant scale, um, but. You, you weigh, so as the ad guy, you know, I sit here and go, yeah, that'd be great, that'd be cool. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons that that'd be great. But to my comment uh, to Lauren earlier, we fight many battles on many different fronts and capital allocation, you know, comes with, with ROI and, and the enterprise business and the mobility business spin off a lot of cash as well. So it becomes just a priorities battle as to where we're gonna spend the 20 or $21 billion a year in capital that we spend and, and uh, you know, is that the place we'd wanna Invest. It would. It would, though. To your question, it would. It would go a long way towards checking the box that is currently unchecked for us. <laughs> Two hundred million dollars. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> way too low. <laughs> I know. Just throw a low ball. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. I, you know, I, there are. Uh, I'm sure that. I'm sure that that valuation rests somewhere in our walls. But I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't happen to know it necessarily. Pew. Pew. Deflected. You got deflected on that one. Yeah. His first answer was pretty good. <laughs> uh, other questions and comments? Say who you are. Uh, my name is Pino. I'm from uh, Mediative. Um, so I want to first say that I'm not in TV, so this question might seem a bit naive, but and I apologize. Uh, but when it comes to your vision for true cross-device targeting, um, have you, th uh, what, what are your thoughts against, or have you started to solve already for, in your 12 million homes and living rooms, multiple users watching the same top, uh, set-top box, and how that translate uh, to mobile and online, and how you identify those users? Yeah, so we've thought about it. We don't have anything in market, but I think the way that you go about doing that, so first of all, I would say addressable household targeting is leaps and bounds away from the way we've ever been able to do it. So we feel like we've got a pretty good mousetrap today, if you will. But there, the, un, the, the obvious next step to that is truly getting it individual, uh, individual level within the house. So ways you could do that would be a smartphone authenticating with a set-top device, you know, from, from sort of some sort of Bluetooth, uh, you know, proximity-based wireless connection. You know, that, that's something they could do. Now, if you did that, um, would probably go down the path of opt-in, you know, which, which, which probably, starts to hinder scale potentially, uh, but, but th that's one way to do it. You know, another way to do it would be uh, similar to sort of what Netflix is doing today, that you know, when, when, you, when you turn on the television, you're, you're sort of acknowledging who you are. Um, but I think I, even that could be suspect. You know, it's self-reported, if you will. So I do think that, that probably the best way to do it accurately would be to, to have the smartphone that you've got a profile around authenticate with a set-top box once it gets in some proximity. 
other questions or comments? Comments are welcome. Mike, anything you, you want to say? Put you on the spot. You're, you're our biggest sponsor, so. Uh, Thanks for dinner, by the way. <laughs> Hope you have plenty of wine. Um, so personally, I mean, I, I like, you know, what Tim Cook says when he says the future of TV is apps, only because we're coming at it from a different direction. So uh, per your comment before about, you know, just duking it out and going to an OTT world and all these apps, I mean, so I take it you're not a believer in that. Oh, no, I, no, I'm not saying I'm not a believer. I think, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a threat for sure, right? I mean, if... if, if uh, Are we moving to an app world? I mean, is that... Hard to say. I mean, with, with smart TV proliferation and with, with sort of these, these, you know, the Apple TVs and the Rokus of the world, I mean, that's obviously where we're trying to push things. A lot of it's going to depend on the model and the people in this room and, 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 and the, you know, the executives making those decisions at the programmers as to will they, will they provide the same content to those services that they're providing to the distributors. You know, is there, is, is there a time when the model bends enough that that, that happens? So, is that a threat to us? Yeah, we, you know, would, would we have a response to that threat? Sure, but um, don't know. I don't know where it ends up. I mean, that's a, it's not the most elegant way to watch today, right? It's not, I mean, we're, we're, we're all used to watching in a certain way where it's a little more fluid, a little more um, uh, uh, so what low drag. So, so, so let's say we did move to an app world, right? And so let's say you're a print publisher, right? And you're starting to create your own content, and it's video. Right, and that, that video may be live, or maybe some people are starting to create their own original series. I mean, do you see more traditional publishers making their way into some kind of a bundle, into some kind of a, a UI where their content, can, and, and would you pay them for that, or would there be a partnership, or, um, or is that just not? Possibly, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the problem is, is, and again, I'll speak to it more from a advertising perspective than from a, maybe from a consumer experience perspective, but you know, we live in a world where there's a lot of networks that are zero rated today, you know? So, so can you really monetize, and again, I'm speaking just from an ad perspective, can you really monetize something like that? Well, yeah, if it's, if it's a print publisher, if it's, the, if it's the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, uh, maybe, you know, but if, it's, if you start to go, you start to go, uh, you, start to, you start to go sort of down the, the long tail, and I just don't know if you get enough viewership from an advertising perspective to, to make any money on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, it may be great from a consumer experience standpoint, you know, ton more content, maybe some unique content that doesn't exist today, but from an advertising perspective, as we all know, eyeballs are what matters. So it's hard to, hard to say. Any other questions, comments? Um, well, State your now. name. Hi, Misty Cornelio, NBC Universal. Actually, I was just reading ATT announced today about the Hello Lab. Okay. For the year-long initiative uh, to uh, partner with the um, content creators from social media, it sounds like that relates a little to what you guys are talking about. Is there an initiative to also capitalize on advertising? You know, I didn't. I didn't actually know about that. It's news oh, okay. to me. So you're, it's uh, it's breaking news. So I will. I'm not sure is my answer. <laughs> well done. Well, it's an interesting initiative. It yeah, is, it shows how everybody's starting to look more to the social media realm for content creators. Yeah, though. I mean, I would say the, the good news. I would say, I mean, I was not aware of that, but I, what I what I am aware of is, we are, you know, Otter is an example. That's an example. We are, we made this big bet, big, you know, outlay of cash with Directv, but that what I mean, it wasn't because we think that the traditional model is going to, you know, live forever. Right. I mean, I mean, it's not like we're like blind to the disintermediation and the and the and the and the, and the downward pressure that, that that we're seeing on ratings. Um, it was really done because there is some life left in that model, and Directv throws off a lot of cash, and the access, the 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 size and scale and access to content that owning that asset gives us allows us to 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 move into other areas, and to to expand beyond just the traditional model. So. We are definitely, to your question, we are definitely not standing still and, and looking to looking to get away, looking to reach out beyond the traditional model while still trying to preserve it. 